kid. Seriously. <laughs> Welcome to an emotional and introspective edition of Star Wars in Review, the only podcast that Maya Madrid forgot to write the intro to. Over this is my better podcasting half over here, that's Luke Neitzel, on this side of the table, Maya Madrid. Every so often we get together, forget the intro writing, and go over Star Wars news, answer your serious, kid seriously questions, and review an episode from the Clone Wars. Luke, I hope you're doing better than me. I, I, you know, I was all set. I was ready. I have my notes and I'm all not. my things we're, we're going to talk not. about. And then right before uh, I hit record, I asked you if you were ready and you smacked yourself in the face. That's how I get that's how I get pumped up, dude. It's like a wrestler. <laughs> but then I wasn't ready because I was giggling. Well, you need to get in the zone. Maybe if you slapped yourself in the face, we'd be all right. I'll just watch you do it. It's fine. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm good. Woo! I'm ready. Okay. How are you? I'm good. Are you going to talk about, this is the part where you talk about the shit going on in your life. You should do it right now. What is going on in my life? I don't know. This is is actually a key, key weekend for me. MLS starts tomorrow, even though there's no fire, which is lame, but I got my my nasty shirt on anyway, um, because I'm ready to go. I can't see it at home, but it's a, it's, it's a t-shirt. It's a t-shirt. It it says fire and Bastion Schweinsteiger on it. Sure does. it's, It's pretty awesome. Atlanta came back last night, so I was really excited about that. Got to watch You're talking episode. about the soccer team. You switched abruptly. I was like, oh, what yeah. the crap do you care about? Atlanta. I do not care about the Atlanta. Silverbacks, but they're not that anymore. They are they? Atlanta United FC. Do they go by the Silverbacks? Or they no, they're, they tried to exist and then folded again. Oh. So they're they're gone, That was a cool name, though. Silverbacks is a cool name. Yeah, it, it was fine, I guess. <clears throat> Don't guess, no. Yeah. So, no, I'm, I'm good. And then it's uh, it's a night's old family holiday on Sunday because the Oscars are here. That's right. That's been, you know, I've I'm, I'm been having a party with my mom since I was in sixth grade for it. And we will continue to do That's that. That's a terrible way of putting that. Hey. You well, need to edit that shit no, out. No, no, no. The, the best part is, is in college, I was the uh, bar back at a gay bar. And I remember having to ask off one night because it was the Oscars and I was going to hang out with my mom to watch it. And I told the manager who, who was gay that that's why I needed it off. And he just went, oh, honey, you belong with us. <laughs> Perfect. But I'm excited. It's going to be fun. I've hey, seen most of the movies. You, uh, should we get to the news? Or do you want, no, you, we forgot a very important part. I saw Black Panther. Oh, yeah. So what did you think? I know you've been waiting a long time. It was amazing. It was amazing. It was everything that I wanted it to be and better. I felt like some of the critiques of the CGI were way overblown. If you follow me on Twitter, I went into like a, like, it felt like an 80 tweet rant about how amazing it was. <laughs> I'm going to be coming out with a review on the movie, um, actually in pieces, talking about each individual character. Uh, I just thought it was amazing. Best villain, one of the best stories, just phenomenal. Love I, it. I like how in this movie and Spider Man, and I haven't, I haven't seen Thor, so Ragnarok. So oh, it's great. Know. Is it? Yeah. Is that- I like how the villains in the, these movies have justifications for what they're doing. They're more complete people that you you don't agree with what they're doing, but you get why they would come to that conclusion. They're not just, I want to rule the world, so I'm going to blow stuff up, or I'm normal. And, and, and Eric Killmonger gets the opportunity. Spoiler, 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 spoiler. Eric Killmonger gets the opportunity to do it and just kind of throws it away, like, kind of through his own anger you know what i mean like yeah. if he had wanted to just take over the world he per- he could have done it yeah as the king of wakanda well that, and, that's and not he was, how he acts it was kind of his plan but you get why he feels that way right and you get why he wants to do that the same way you honestly really really agreed with what the vultures rationale was in spider-man as well I mean, he was screwed over majorly uh, so i like that they're giving more depth to their villains i think that's what makes them more memorable and that's always been the big critique of marvel is that other than loki the villains aren't memorable, and I think they've done a really excellent job with Killmonger and with the Vulture of making whole characters that are interesting and fun and stick with you and that you want you want to see more of. I feel like we've talked a lot about Eric Stevens, uh, Michael B. Jordan, Killmonger. We didn't mention Shuri yet, which seems like kind of a travesty, and uh, she's one of the most amazing side characters in any Marvel film. My daughter and my wife are absolutely in love with her. She is phenomenal. And you know, if you know comics and you know how smart T'Challa is and how he has to take a backseat to his little sister, like, in the context of the movies, she's one of the smartest people alive. That's all, awesome. All the side characters in yeah. there. Oh, yeah. Really she wasn't even my favorite. I love, really I love uh, Okoye. Like, it's yeah. Phenomenal. And 
Yeah, no, it, it was awesome. I mean, the the week the week two links to me in there are Martin Freeman and, and Andy Serkis. Andy Serkis is a little too cartoonish, but he is entertaining in what he does. And then Martin Freeman is kind of there for exposition and to link to the greater universe. I And see, the thing about Martin Freeman, and I don't want to bash this movie at all, so please don't take this at home as a bash. We both love this movie. Right. What I'll say about uh, about Freeman's character, it wasn't the Ross from the comics and the Christopher Priest run that I really wanted. That oh, character okay. is built on Chandler from Friends. Oh, funny. <laughs> and uh, it just wasn't the sort of silly and zaniness that I was expecting. And, and that was true in Civil War. I mean, I kind of knew it was going to be this way because his character wasn't jokey and crazy uh, like he is in the comics. And that was one... I mean, I don't think Freeman did a bad job. It was, that was the way that it was written for him. And, and I understand that they had to do with certain things. Well, uh, and I just think that character... That was in there to explain because they needed someone to to be explaining how wakandan technology worked Mm -hmm. so they brought him there and they brought him around so they could explain how the technology worked so the the viewer would understand it but they had already kind of done that a few different times using other methods so it felt kind of repetitive and then martin freeman's fine but that i don't know anything about that character in the comics but as he's been presented in the movies there's nothing spectacular about him he's kind of a blander colson in in the comics t'challa is such you know he's very much how he was in the civil war movie where he's just he's on a mission and he doesn't give two craps on whether or not he fills the audience in on what he's doing and so ross fills this role of sort of like this zany dude who's trying to explain to his boss that he's sleeping with um all this like jumbled mess all out of order like like uh uh what's that movie uh pulp fiction oh sure trying to explain what's happening so that t'challa doesn't have to Oh, okay. And so, and it's awesome. Christopher Priest did a wonderful job with that. Yeah, but that that movie's awesome. I'm glad you finally got to see it, because I knew that was one of your favorite characters, and yeah. how disappointed you were that it didn't work out the first weekend. Yeah, I mean, my, my so. kid was sick. And you know what? Yeah. It was worth it to, to wait when, when your your kid is having so much fun watching Shuri, and mom and dad are bawling just because of how awesome that movie was. And not bawling for all of the people who were very emotional about that because it, it filled a place for them in the superhero comics that had never or superhero movies I should say that had never been seen before. Um, I just wept because it was a great movie. Yeah, and yeah. and so um, it was and just there's so many reasons that so many people like this movie. And Oakland in 1992. I know Luke. You know I grew up in Southern California in 1992, and with the Rodney King beatings and the Rodney King riots, um, it had me right at that too. How that kind of, the movie starts off there. I can't say enough good things. And hey, if you want to hear more about it or read more about it, uh, like that will be up soon. Yeah. Check the website out. So let's talk about the news. (laughs) All right. The novelization of The Last Jedi is on its way and it's going to hit about the same time that the home theatrical release of the movie comes out. Not surprising, these things come out uh, right around those sort of times, and it's bought like by fanboys like us. Now, often you get a little nugget that expands the universe in some way, but not here. This book is going to bring a big chicken tender of information, uh, two actually, giving background on Supreme Commander Snoke, and it's going to begin with Luke Skywalker dreaming about Kami, the wife that he never had from the deleted scene of A New Hope. Ooh. Luke, how do you like novelizations? Do you like them by the book, so to speak? Or do you prefer these sorts of revelations that come out in the movie and not save for the book? What do you, what do you think? I, I'm okay with it. I, I don't buy them and I don't read them. Mm-hmm. I, I read articles about them that tell me the fun parts that are different. I have a feeling with the extended universe of Star Wars that everything's canon until the movies decide they don't want it to be canon. So anything that's in this book, I know technically it's canon, but if J.J. Abrams says it doesn't work for him in the next movie, then he'll just redo it, and then suddenly it's not canon. And you can see that a ton in Clone Wars. They wanted to get rid of that, though. I mean, they wanted to avoid that, and then they've gone back on it so quickly. You know what I mean? That was the problem with the EU. No, I mean, I, I don't think there probably should be such a thing as that sort of hardcore canon, because you need the filmmakers to have that stuff, but... Yeah, you, you don't know. want to limit people too much. Right. And I'm of the belief, just like they seem to be doing with the movies, of give it to a, an artist, give them some guidelines, but let them do their thing that they want to do, and right. that's what they're doing with the novels, then I'm all for it. And again, if you if there's something in there that doesn't mesh with what they want to do in the movie world, then they'll just do what they want in the movie world, and it'll be fine. So, you know, why? what would be the point of putting out a book that's just the movie word for word? 
you know, if you're going to do that, just release the script in book form. So if, if you're going to have people pay for a novel, give them something more than what we can get from deleted scenes and what we can get from just watching the movie. You know what issue I have with this? Hmm. I'm pretty sure, and I could be mistaken, and I didn't rewatch this just on the hope that I might be mistaken. I think, isn't Kami the girl that already has a boyfriend and is calling him Wormy the whole time? Have you seen the deleted scenes? I've never seen that deleted scene. Oh, okay. Scene. It's from so, a New Hope? Yeah, I'm pretty sure like she's the chick that's hanging out with one of Luke's friends. And so like oh, Luke's really? like dreaming about this chick that like wasn't even his oh. girlfriend. That's that's a little shady. Hey, people have been there. I'm, I'm sure there are plenty of us that have had an experience, whether it was minor crush or apparently stalking to the point of marrying them later. But, you know, had a, a buddy who had a girlfriend or something like that that you had an attraction to and, and whatnot. I don't think it's that far out there. It's it's in the same range as, you know, we know plenty of couples where they were friends for 15 years and then something clicked one night and all of a sudden they're together as a couple. So it, you, you make a decent point, Luke. You know what, uh, what just jumped into my mind? I have a, a guess what might have just jumped into your mind. That's a, it's a step up from making out with your sister? It is a step up for making up to your sister. I thought you might talk about maybe, I don't know, people who are married who, you know, maybe knew each other a little bit in high school and then reconnected years later and got married. I don't know. That sounds stupid. Let's move on to number two. <laughs> Just kidding, honey. Uh, we know that Solo now is going to take place. It's going to start 12 years before A New Hope. And it confirms the rumor that the movie is going to be much longer uh, before than originally thought. Cause How long? Of, uh, just 12, 12 years. Oh, I was thinking you meant runtime. Okay. okay. Yeah, so um, it's 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 a lot farther away, I should say, um, than A New Hope. Um, on its face, this maybe helps Alden Ehrenreich in his quest to convince us that he's Han Solo. But it also presents a couple of questions. Uh, what sort of tie-ins that we might see in the larger Star Wars universe? Is it going to be Vader, Boba Fett? Jabba the Hutt with a large Grand Moff Tarkin tattoo on his belly <laughs> from last week. Uh, who do you want to see in this movie, if anybody? Are you happy about the time frame, like, like pushing it back farther than we thought? And is this going to end up with Alden Ehrenreich playing a teenager? If so, is that even remotely believable? I, I think it would, early 20s is probably what they're going for, and even that's probably a stretch. I don't know what what age he really is in real life. But is it, you know, Harrison Ford was in his mid-30s, wasn't he, when they... They made those movies. I want to say it was like thirty four ish. I thought he was twenty nine, but I could there. be wrong. I think I think originally he was supposed to be mid thirties, and then they may have. Well, Harrison Ford was whatever age he was. He well, didn't that's what age. I meant because they but, don't really yeah. say Han Solo's I age. I thought he was supposed to be thirty five when they first came out, and then when they came out with Return of the Jedi, they sort of like said, "No, he's twenty nine, so he's only ten years older than Leia." So it wasn't that creepy. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not. I'm not too worried about those stuff. I think that's just something suspension of disbelief. Yeah. You have to be cool with. Obviously, you can't get Harrison Ford to do it because he hates Star Wars and he's way too old. I think he likes Star Wars a little bit more now. I think he loved The Force did, Awakens roundabout. No? Didn't you just see what he what they just said? No. Oh, he just did an interview somewhere uh, where... It's bad. I usually look at the news for this stuff. I know. I've had a busy week. But they asked him about what it was like to hand the torch off to the new cast and all that stuff. And yeah. his response in Harrison Ford fashion was, well, I don't care about any... I'm paraphrasing, but I don't care about any of that. I just wanted to kill Han for once and get done. <laughs> so I... I and, and if you saw any of his interviews, I know he's probably joking and probably stoned when he's on a lot of the talk shows. But I watched some of the interviews of him promoting it. And they... You know, his response to why did you want to come back a lot was they paid me a lot of money. Right. Yeah, I, I don't think... Indiana Jones, he seems to have a lot of affection for and a lot of attachment to. I think he hates Han Solo if you had to had to really boil it down to it. I don't think he likes being uh, talking about it. I don't think he likes being approached, approached by people about it. I think he just wanted to be done with it, and Force Awakens was a big payday and a way to be done with it. So I, I think he's he's happy... To be out. Why did he help? He showed up on set, or didn't he do something with Aaron Reich where he like helped him out in some way or gave him advice? Probably. Know. They probably paid him. <laughs> are we gave, ready to give him some weed? Yeah, you are so <laughs> so negative today. Should we go to kid seriously serious serious kid seriously questions? Seriously. All right. We don't have a bumper, so you can talk. Oh. I hope you edit that out. Nope, we're leaving that in. Damn it. I thought there was a bumper for that. <laughs> you better no... come up with a bumper. I'll work out a bumper for that. You're just going to wait for time. next week, right? So that I have yes. that long pause? Yes. No, we're wow, leaving that Wow, that in. sounds stupid. All right. It's been a pretty big week here, and you're not going to ruin it. It's been a pretty big week here at Kid Series. The biggest week. Uh, it's been all over our family of platforms. 
<laughs> yes, let's call it a family of platforms. Just like that. Uh, I'm a big fan of the movie trivia Schmodown, which you know. I never miss it. And I got into a Twitter conversation with Lon Harris, and he's the guy that's known as the professor. His sure. Because he's super big dick and uh, like just talking down to people, which I love. Um, he's also affiliated with Screen Junkies, and we got to talking about one of my favorite bands, Pavement. And so, naturally, he becomes one of my... F- Wait, uh, so that's the band that does the theme song to PTI, right? Shut up. Kay. You're a jerk. Don't ruin this for me. <laughs> In any event, it was like the first like celebrity, quote-unquote, that I had a Twitter conversation with. I've only been on Twitter for a couple of weeks now, and, and that was exciting. Um, then, last night, Ricky Gervais... He uh, he liked one of my tweets, which was really exciting. But that's not the biggest news because I'm. This is not about me. It's about a lot of different things. And Jed Dawson, one of the guys who writes for us, wrote an article about Neil Gaiman's Black Orchid, and I thought it was like really strong when I was reading through it. And everything he does, I think, is strong, and that's the reason that he writes for us. And he got retweeted by Neil Gaiman, and it like crushed our website. It was awesome. So many people were reading about him. No, I well, I don't. I don't even think that's the biggest. I, obviously, that was. That was amazing because we're big into looking at the analytics, and I get really excited about seeing different like countries four, yeah. where people hit. And we hit every single continent the night Neil Gaiman retweeted that. Uh, you know, we had people in New Zealand and Australia and Thailand and South Africa and all these places looking at our website, which is insane. I mean, this is something that we did. It came up in an email chain because we were fighting in an email chain about Last Jedi, and one of us said, "Well, we should save this for our podcast." And then the other one just went, yeah, why don't we? And this started as something to get us to hang out more, to have fun, to play around, to be creative, and to think two months into it that Neil Gaiman read a piece that's associated with our website. I like how it's just associated with us because like we had nothing to do with it. It was general. No, and he is, he is a mu- and I'm going to link his soccer blog that everyone should check out to the bottom of yeah. this video. He is a much more accomplished professional you know, he, he knows what he's doing at this, where we're two guys fucking around in a basement, but he's, we're lucky enough that, that he's, he's friends with us and we'll post stuff on our website. But I just, the thought that Neil Gaiman clicked on our website is, it is a lot. It's, 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 it's it makes me like, like I'm fanning myself over here. Um, yeah. Next, we got an email from YouTube <laughs> telling us that Universal Pictures put a copyright claim on one of our videos. Which uh, made us feel really good. Uh, made me feel really scared because I didn't know what that meant when, when Luke told me. <laughs> Luckily, I got the email. Yes. Because we have... didn't do anything wrong. We were using image, official copyrighted images for the purposes of review, which is completely legal and within the limits. But what Universal did was they, they marked them as copyrighted material, which allows them then to check out how many views we're getting so they can monitor how much publicity the movie is getting. And also, in theory, they could monetize our video if they wanted, but, you know, good luck. But that also makes me laugh because I picture some abused, getting coffee thrown at him intern in Universal Studios had to click on our YouTube video. Take that, intern! And watch us make fun of a movie neither of us want to see. So, thanks, Universal. But all of that, Neil Gaiman, The Professor... Ricky Gervais, Universal Pictures, it's all second to this. Pat, in Kansas City, a real-life human being (laughs) that neither you or I probably know. That we think. That we think. We don't know. Uh, Unless they created, like, some sort of burner email and it's like... Oh my gosh, yeah. Which could totally happen. Yeah, I wouldn't put it past. Okay. He wrote into the show. We got a question from a non-friend. Right, or daughter. Like, my daughter. Or, yeah, yeah. or family member. So. Which means at least one person, well, no, two people other than the the Universal intern and someone else that we don't know has watched one of our videos. Which is so much farther than we ever wanted to go. But anyways. And they wrote a question. I know. Let's talk about the question. It's the best question we've ever got, all right? So here it is. Okay. Because I haven't seen this. Right. I just found this, and it's a fun show, says Pat. How? But what in the hell does Kid Seriously mean, anyways? <laughs> Is that really That's what the they question? Wrote? Yes. Do you want me to explain I, this? I, I think it's better coming for you as the outsider. Okay. So, uh, as Maya mentioned, he, as a child, a young child, grew up in Southern California. 
But uh, he went to high school in a town called La Crosse, Wisconsin, which is on the... Red Raiders, what? Yeah, exactly. Which is on the western border of Wisconsin with Minnesota. And Maya and I met at the University of Minnesota when we were in college, along with some of Maya's other high school friends. And including... uh, He didn't go to the U of M, but that's how you know Jed. Right. And there is a particular way of speaking in lacrosse that was unique to someone like myself living in the twin cities where uh if you've ever seen the movie donnie brasco and they talk about saying forget about it among all the gangsters kid is the lacrosse version of that (laughs) it has about 80 meeting 80 different meetings meanings kid so you you say kid to describe friends situations people uh regret regret different inflections of it mean different things it's its whole it's its whole language in and of itself for people from lacrosse to say kid and i fell in with all these lacrosse people and listened to them interact and do it and then started picking it up myself first as self-mockingly or as mocking you guys and then just getting involved in it but one of the things that was repeated very often when you had to emphasize something that was of life or death importance was to go kid seriously kid and then you would say whatever said important thing was uh so that is the genesis of what we named our thing after um i don't know if it makes sense or if it's funny to anyone other than you or me but that's what it is it was said that one of uh one of our friends garth and i had an entire conversation where we just said kid and seriously for like three minutes i would believe it. and the funny thing is is you know i i spend time with both of you and i spend time with both of you apart and garth lives in a you know a suburb of the Twin Cities, and he does not talk like that at all. But the minute you put two lacrosse people in a room together, it just all immediately changes. And, and there's 90 kids thrown in there. Uh, you know, like, he probably hasn't said the word kid, you know, in, in months. And then you show up and get in a room with him, and it's just kid. 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 kid look at this. Seriously. Kid, kid, watch this movie, kid. Kid. Kid, I gotta tell you. Kid, don't be a so, punk. So thank you. Pat's in Kansas City, Pat, assuming you might be real. If you are real, uh, when we, whenever we make our first t-shirts, <laughs> and I think the first one's going to say, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> You're getting one. Yeah, I will you, send Mark. it to you. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of, uh, The Wink asks us, if you could incorporate one fictional character into the Star Wars universe from some other story or medium, who would it be? So I am a big fan of... Uh, you know, the Rebels, I'm always cheering for the good guys. And they're always outnumbered and kind of on the retreat and on the run. So I feel like they need something that's kind of big and offensive that'll help them kind of turn the tide a little bit more. So I want Kool-Aid Man (laughs) to be part of the Rebels. (laughs) He could just bust through starship after starship, (laughs) knocking them down. They could run behind him while he, he busts in and and you know, fire their blasters around him and stuff. I think he would, he would turn the tide a lot quicker. I mean, imagine getting into that bunker on Endor. You got to have this big elaborate plan with knocking and faking stuff. Kool Aid Man would have ripped that shit up in like thirty seconds. He would have just busted through the wall. Done. I'm glad you took this so seriously because I took mine actually <laughs> seriously. Well, okay. I thought about in it for fairness, a long time. You gave it to me. I just did. Now. I gave it to you. Or, I, I gave it to you now, this. and I looked at it for probably. Four or five days. Or so three days I also want to emphasize that this episode has a different tone than most of our episodes. That I'm drinking and you're extremely tired. <laughs> right, that's true. Um, so it's gonna be the best episode or the worst. Uh, either way, <laughs> it's gonna be Halloran from uh, The Shining. Oh, okay. I think it would be cool to have first a horror Star Wars film. I think I'm ready for that. Oh, that would and be good. Second, a sort of guy who can like pick that out in people, almost like Maz Kanata, but good. Almost like a Jedi. No. Uh, a non Jedi. Oh, okay. Like. You have nothing to say about that. I give I you just, something that I put a lot of thought in. You just gonna sit there, I, I be like, snarky. I like that character, yeah, but I kind of feel like dick. he's he's just one of the small skill sets of a Jedi. I feel like you need to find something You're a small skill set of a Jedi. Well, yeah, he's like he's like a you know he can do one of the things that Jedi's can kind of do, and then none of the other things that Dude, they I do. You know, like you. let's get let's get something bigger you know get get blade in there yeah or like the you know? freaking kool-aid get... man like the kool-aid man that's what you go with i did go with kool-aid man and I hey, we're gonna put this that. on you need to put this on twitter right after this who would be better in a star wars movie halloran or or the, the kool-aid, kool-aid man okay man. We'll, st- we'll start a poll and see we if should. anyone does okay i want to start it from a week and we'll open it up the okay. next time that we record this 
and then that's who would help be the winner. The Rebel Alliance more. No. Oh wait. No, one? it's who. Who would you want for what fictional character would you want in a Star Wars? Movie? Oh, okay. All right. Okay. I feel like I'm gonna lose. All right. Now comes the part of the podcast where we continue our return to the Clone Wars and review an episode from the series. Tonight we're looking at an episode called "Downfall of a Droid." It's season one, episode six. Trust in your friends, and they will have reason to trust in you. This time around, we got two newbies, Rob Coleman directing and George Christick on the pens. Battles still rage on the Outer Rim, and Grievous continues his nefarious plots over his obsession, one Anakin Skywalker. But as the pair do battle once more, R2-D2 is lost in the melee and disappears. As they struggle to find him, things get mysteriously worse and worse as everything seems to go wrong for the Republic. Luke, your feelings. Well, let's go through the story a little bit. So- All right. This starts out with uh, Anakin and Obi-Wan have split up. Anakin is still in the Outer Rim with his group of soldiers, including Rex, who's his commander, and Ahsoka. And they, according to narration, have been getting pummeled by Grievous. May I interrupt here for just a second? Please do. I would like to switch up and just say that's not exactly how it starts. The way it starts is with some terrible music. That sounds like it's in a disco rave in the 1990s. They had some weird musical choices this in this one. This was very bad, that... and it made me upset and took me out of it. <laughs> oh, no. But anyway, they start out like that. Uh, Grievous is, is coming to take out the remaining few ships that Anakin has left. He has three cruisers with him, and they know they're outnumbered and outgunned by Grievous. So they set up a little trap for Grievous. Grievous arrives at the beginning of the episode thinking he has the upper hand. The rebels are, or the uh, Republic are in an uh, asteroid field. And naturally, Grievous should think that he had the upper hand because the last time we saw him, he was driving his super big thing right into a moon and then fleeing. And then he comes back with all this machinery. And once again, Anakin and the, the Republic are like the the uh, guys who are the underdogs. There's some consistency issues with what's, what's going on with Grievous. But anyway... Uh, Grievous' ships are arriving and they are going to go through the asteroid field because for some reason that gives them a tactical advantage. I didn't ask. They didn't explain. I'm not going to bother with it. They decide to go through the asteroid field. They put all their power into their forward shields because they don't think that the Republic can get around them because of the asteroids and they want to block the asteroids from hitting them. So they put everything into forward shields and they go at the Republic and they start pummeling them. But what Anakin has done is actually had Rex deploy a number of his tanks. They're kind of AT-AT, but smaller. They're in uh, Attack of the Clones in the Geonosis battle. But he has them on the asteroids, which I thought was kind of a cool touch. Mm -hmm. And so when the ships of Grievous go past the asteroids, they can just start firing on them from behind, and there is no shields there to protect them. naturally they would know that Grievous' plan was to put all the power in the shields facing forward. Obviously. What else would he have done? Uh, and then Anakin takes his squad squadron out there to fight. He's got R2 with him. They go in and start blowing up all of all of the ships. Grievous realizes he's screwed yet again. Gets in his ship to flee after knocking the head off of a droid. Naturally. And, <laughs> naturally. Uh, as he's flying away, Anakin notices he, he's flying away. So Anakin pursues to try and take Grievous out before he can jump to light speed. But Anakin's star cruiser gets hit with shrapnel from an exploding, exploding droid cruiser. And it basically spins out, and Anakin passes out. And when he comes to, he's in a medical lab with Ahsoka and Rex, saying, hey, we won the battle, but Grievous escaped. But what they realize is that R2 was not recovered. So they're not sure if he's gone or if he's missing or if he blew up in the explosion. Obi-Wan, in what is now becoming typical Obi-Wan fashion, is like, fuck it, it's a droid. Who, get, who cares? Leave it. <laughs> But he's Anakin, such a jerk. he's such a dick. But Anakin is is. I don't a, seem to remember ever owning a droid before. I totally believe it. Yeah, now. he doesn't give a crap. Yeah, exactly. He probably really doesn't remember because he does not care about them. Anakin then admits that he hasn't been wiping R 2s memory, which apparently is the protocol. So R two is loaded with all their battle plans and secret bases. So if he is floating out there and the droid army gets him, it's going to be a big deal because he's got all their battle plans. So Ahsoka and him leave to go get R2. And they go to the wreckage and they find he's not there. But in the wreckage, they also see a junk ship floating around. So they go and they dock on that. 
and they kind of pose like they're going to buy from the junk it's a dealer. Nice romantic couple, like a twenty-five-year-old, yeah, and they, like a ten-year-old, and a teenager. How old is Ahsoka? She's a teenager is at she? this stage, yeah, I believe. Yeah, she yeah. seems kind of creepy. Yeah, uh, maybe wouldn't her... put it past the Skywalker family. But... Well, yeah, at least she's not related to him that we know of yet. But they go on the ship. They go to look for R2. The guy's kind of weird and resistant. They also have another protocol droid with them. That's It's an R3 unit. That... Um, you mean astromech droid? Yes, that's exactly what I meant. And he's gold, so they call him Goldie. And Anakin hates him and doesn't want him there because he's not R2. And they go and they let him look through the bowels of the ship. And there is a bunch of IG assassin droids, which if you've seen Empire Strikes Back, IG-88 is the droid that's standing on the bridge when they're talking to Boba Fett and the other bounty hunters about capturing Solo. So they have a bunch of those there. And they ask their new R3, Goldie, to turn some do- open some doors or something like that. But he accidentally, we don't what? know, what? turns on the assassin droids, oh. which is extremely reminiscent of the movie where Ahsoka and Anakin are walking down a hallway and there's a bunch of battle droids and they have to fight them. They do the same thing with the assassin droids and they beat them. And exactly like the movie, Ahsoka beats the last one and makes a snarky comment and then Anakin goes, but you missed one, and then kills the last one. And then they realize that R2's not there. And Anakin is pissed and about to murder the junk dealer because he thinks he hurt R2 there. You know, this is the guy that's going to be Darth Vader, so that would have been totally it, it, badass. And, you know? Yeah, and it, it makes sense or whatever. But then Ahsoka convinces him he's not there, so they leave, and then it's revealed that, of course, R2 is a prisoner on that ship, and that this junk dealer is going to sell him to General Grievous. Because the junk dealer knew how to get into all the information, and gave that to Grievous, yes. naturally. Yeah, within, Ugh. like, an hour, basically, of of the ship Man, all these things up. coming together in happenstance, it's amazing. Oh, it's, uh, colliding, it's fate. It's always fate. <laughs> uh, so then Anakin and Ahsoka go back to the main ship. They realize uh, that they probably have to let R2 go. He probably blew up. And we find out that they believe, the Republic believes that there is some type of secret base that Grievous is intercepting their signals out of in the system. So they have to go hunt for the base. So, what? Anna- exactly. It's probably Darth Sidious, right? It's Darth... You, Did I... You're, look, you're looking at me like it's not Darth Sidious. Like there, Who... there may be something else. I don't know. Palpatine said he's not a problem and I trust that guy. So, so anyway, so they, are you saying it may be somebody else in the episode? We we just have to see. Oh so, my goodness! So they go out to uh, they they go out to go try and find the secret base. Anakin has Goldie now in his ship, hmm. and they split off from the main group to go search for this base where Goldie accidentally dum 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 turns on his signal beacon, which why alerts. Would he, why would he turn off the signal? I don't his, know. It's, it's so weird. weird. So that alerts Grievous and everyone else where Anakin is. Grievous immediately shows up with like eight battle cruisers ready to take Anakin out. And weirdly, Goldie just is so panicky under pressure. Accidentally blows up the hyperdrive. Can't get anything That's right. That's a bad day. Yeah. When your droid is screwing you, you up You know what? Much. I have a bad feeling about this. That's all I can say in this battle. I have nothing to say in response to that. Nicely, it, nicely put. Thank you. They end up... They end up almost getting destroyed, but then Ahsoka shows up. Weirdly, they've been using the same cargo ship they stole from a junk planet that in the movie. That dude's dead, though. The, the owner was a was a droid, so it's cool. Well, yeah, but why would you be using a junk freighter <laughs> dude, that barely works? Possession in the you... galaxy is nine-tenths of the law. I'm not saying it's illegal. I'm saying couldn't you have got a better ship from your armada? But anyway, they come and they save Anakin, and R2 is still out there. So that's where we leave. It's a cliffhanger you, episode. You think R2's going to die? I think R2's dead. Oh I think God. he's going to give all the pl- all the plans to Grievous. Grievous is going to eliminate the Republic. Set so they're going to rule. It's going to it's going to work out well for everyone. Well, the show's going to be really Taxes short then. Taxes will be low though. Oh, that's good. So, we'll all be good. It's good. Tariff, you know, tariffs will be high though. Imagine what you could do with a dollar 50 a week in Republic credits. <laughs> There's a lot you could buy with that. Man, I hate this episode. It's six of six for me. The theme is rebaked. It was so bad that I went and looked. Now, I, I should start with the good. I want to be positive here. I thought that there were moments where the clarity and the high definition of the characters really popped more than it had in any episode. And that is the one good thing that I can say about it. I hate that music. Like I said, the theme is the same theme that they've done, but this time with droids. <laughs> like I, I felt like there was going to be somebody saying, now with droids. And I looked <laughs> for uh, Rob Coleman. Sure. And I was like, this dude's terrible. Like, I'm going to, you know, look at these guys and I'm going to, like, 
you know, just I'm going to talk about his, and, and he's not in the series very long. So I was like, yeah, he's not in the series very long because this guy's no, that dude's been nominated for two Oscars. Really? For <laughs> yeah. what? For Star Wars uh, stuff, uh, episode one, episode two. Like, uh, I don't know, some sort of like animation crap. Oh, he man. Animates. Hey, why, why not? There, there are things that I like about this episode. Oh, tell it's, me what, it's, it's not a six for six. I what? I like that Obi Wan is a dick. I like that he he says, "Well, you can't be attached to things. That's that's not what Jedi's do. Just let it go." Because I think this is the type of things that would push Anakin to be Darth Vader. And I like the fact that Anakin is a huge dick to Goldie, even though Goldie is the most obvious turncoat. You know, in the are you serious? I totally it's... believe that. Oh my god. I'm not sure because I haven't seen the next one yet, but but he is just he hates Goldie from the get go, just based on the fact that it's not R two. Good judge of character, that guy. That guy sure he's is. Good as he hangs with Palpatine so much. Exactly, he's learning things. But it goes, it plays into this kind of Anakin is uh, impulsive. He's not able to let things go. He's very much into his attachment to certain things, and he he's angry. He's really angry that R two is possibly dead or missing willing to kill people because he's dead and missing. So I think it's a good representation of both those characters, but it's not a very fun narrative. There are some, you alluded to the music. This starts out with a really boisterous instrumental score. And then they have, like you mentioned, there's a part where the junk dealer goes to sleep and that's where they reveal that R2 is there. And he's listening to like weird disco music or something. That comes out of nowhere. I thought my sister was going to come out with like a cowboy hat and a feather boa with glow sticks. And I know, dancing. I was like, Pretty from college was going to whip in and hand us all ecstasy. But it, it was it was really weird. I also, I don't know if this was my TV, but the volume on the music seemed obscenely high. Yeah. Too compared really, to other episodes. They were really pumping it, baby. Yeah. And, and not just that, the instrumental score blared out some of the dialogue at certain points. This, this is not... Not an award-winning episode by any means. I not even an award-nominated episode, much less. Oh, I think that I'm confused a little bit because it seems like there's no cohesion to what's happening in this season at all. It's almost you could almost believe that they have a different writer for every everyone that's every episode that hasn't talked to any other writer and they're just doing their their own thing. The tones are completely different from episode to episode. There is no continuous story arc whatsoever. In fact, things flip very much. We've talked about it before, but Grievous, they keep telling us Grievous is this massive force, but he gets beat down and everything, and whether he thinks he's winning or thinks he's losing changes from episode to episode, I don't get what they're doing with him. Here's the shocker. This season was aired out of order. Was it aired out? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, Reveal! <gasps> it... It shows yeah. that because there is there is no overarching story and there is just no cohesion to what is unfolding before us. Everything is a roll of the dice. What you're going to get episode to episode. I haven't taken the time to actually map out the original or the way that it should go, and I don't know if it'd be better. But we're putting them in the, the way that they come out. So yeah, it's definitely a negative on it. Yeah, I, I'm still going to say that I enjoyed this more than the bomber run episode so this would be five of six for me that was the one where space uh, manatees yes yeah so it, i don't think they were manatees man they're more like like rays they sucked whatever they were oh yeah they were rays. rays they weren't manatees yeah. they would have been cooler if they were manatees i like the orange yeah, that's, i'd rather that's talk great. more i'd rather do another segment about that episode than this episode oh yeah yeah i i think this is more a little bit more enjoyable i think the, the race in the next episode, I'm assuming, to rescue R2 before Grievous gets him could be interesting. So also I'm also directed by Rob Coleman. So it probably won't be good. <laughs> More disco Oscar music. Oscar nominated. Oscar nominated. I don't know. I don't know. Whatever. Yeah, it's it's a toss-away episode. and it, It's disappointing because the last episode was so good. It was by far the best one, Rookies, that to have that kind of intensity and excitement and good character work and then to go back to more of a Tom and Jerry approach... It's a letdown. Let's move on to other news. I'm a nerd. We have news for the beautiful people. There's a lot more of us in our view. Luke, what other nerd news has you going this week? Well, I mentioned at the beginning of the show, it's a Neitzel family holiday on Sunday, which is the day this will be released. So today. But you're probably not listening to it today. So who knows what day you're listening to it. But I have They're been... actually moving the Oscars whenever our viewers listen to it. Exactly. It'll be that news. day. Uh, so... 
I've been watching the the best picture nominees. I've I got to watch six out of nine. Usually I go for all of them, but this year I just haven't had the time to get out there and see. But I saw all the ones that I think have a chance to win. Call Me by Your Name is the one that I think has the biggest chance for awards that I didn't get to see. The other ones I didn't see were Phantom Thread and The Post. Uh, but I am I am a big big fan of Get Out. I'm hoping that can pull some upsets off. But I do did also enjoy The Shape of Water, which is a really stupid premise on paper. I probably wouldn't have seen it if it wasn't a Best Picture nominee, though I do like Del Toro, uh, Guillermo del Toro a lot. Yeah. But man, they really pulled off a concept that I had no interest in in a really kind of magical, fantastic way. I can't believe how much I enjoyed that movie. So if that is able to nab Best Director and maybe Best Picture, I would be happy with that as well. Uh, Three Billboard, Billboards is something i'd have to see again because tonally it's not what i thought it was at all it's a very surreal hyper cartoon type world which i wasn't expecting so maybe i'd like it better on the second one but i that that has a, a good shot at winning best picture but it's not what i'm i'm cheering for and then uh, i saw darkest hour and lady bird and uh dunkirk and you know had a had a decent time with all of those so for overall best picture nominees it's a it's a good year with them not using all of the 10 slots, I'm disappointed that um, both Killing of a Sacred Deer and Wonder Woman weren't able to sneak in there because those are two movies that I think deserve some recognition. But uh, I am excited for award time. What about you? What uh, what other nerd stuff have you been into? I've been uh, reviewing a lot of Kevin Smith stuff this week. And not so much the movies, um, but just a lot of the YouTube videos and things that I've seen in the past and some of his stand-up where he's just really talking about his experiences in Hollywood. And as many of you know, last week he had a massive heart attack and nearly died. And I didn't really appreciate in my life how much Kevin Smith really means to me. Clerks was a movie that changed a lot of my life. Like it, We probably wouldn't have this show without Clerks because I didn't get back into Star Wars until they had that conversation in Clerks. <laughs> um, I know you haven't always been a big fan of his dialogue, uh, but I always liked it. My friends and I talk like that as kids. And the movie was the reason why, you know. I mean, I got stink-palmed by some bastard <laughs> in uh, in high school because of Mallrats. And it was the perfect director at the perfect time with the perfect attitude for what I was going on in my life. And I've always had a big affection for him ever since. And um, to hear, you know, and lots of people, they talk about Prince dying and that's a big deal for them. And, and uh, David Bowie. But this, this would have been one of the biggest ones for me. And I didn't realize it until I thought about it. Have you read any of his comic book writing arcs? I never have, but I just was curious. I know he did stints on Daredevil, which is one of your favorite characters. And I know he did stints on Green Arrow, which I don't think is one of your favorite characters. But have you ever read any of his comic books? You know, the, my favorite one was, it's funny, I only read half of it because he's such a stoner that he didn't even, I don't know if he actually ever finished it. I was waiting for months for it to come out, but he's probably just high. Um, <laughs> but it was uh, Spider-Man and Black Cat. And I was trying to, it was, this was back in like, gosh, 2002, maybe. And I'm trying to like get you into it. And, you know, and you're like, well, what do you like about it? And I was like, it's got this long dialogue that's like really funny. And you're like, I hate Kevin Smith's dialogue. <laughs> so, um, I'll always remember that because we had the conversation at the time when it came out. And I was like, oh, I can't wait until the other, I think it was the other two or something. And he just, I don't know if you ever finished it. I should look on Marvel <laughs> Unlimited because, uh. Fucking stoner. No, I have I've read a little bit of his Daredevil, and that's one of the things that I'm gonna hit up next. I've just been reading a lot of Avengers stuff for the for the website, and a lot of Star Wars stuff for the website. But uh, I probably will go back because you don't you don't realize what you have until it's gone or until it's almost gone. Yeah, and he is not an old man, so no, I mean, he's about ten years older than us, I think. Yeah, so you know you don't you don't want to see anyone go that early. Yeah, so um, I'll be writing an article about that. I'm actually have it outlined and ready to go. I've just been thinking a lot about it, so. Uh, to be continued but as for now that's about all we have luke neitzel where can they find you i am on twitter luke underscore neitzel n-e-i-t-z-e-l and our website is www.kidseriously.wordpress.com we are also excited to announce in this week we are verified on youtube because we're so good at what we do or because we just gave him a phone number one of the two but what that means is now we are not uh restricted by a 15 minute limit on our videos so hopefully you are listening to this as one long 50 minute video are you saying that we can become one we can become one i'm at my madrid we'll see you later bye <laughs>
Thank you for listening to Kids Seriously. This episode was recorded and produced at Camro Studios. Visit our website at www.kidsseriously.wordpress.com or email us at kidsseriouslyradio at gmail.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at Kids Seriously. Until next time. <laughs>